Good morning. My name's Duncan, and I want to welcome each and every one of you to our online Sunday service. You are so, so welcome. We're going to begin our service in prayer. And in particular, I want to pray for three groups of people. So firstly, I want to pray for you if you're not a Christian, if you wouldn't say you're a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, you are so welcome to join us for this service and to watch this video. Thank you for being here. I just want to pray for you very, very briefly. Heavenly Father, I thank you for those who are watching this church service who wouldn't describe themselves as Christians. And Lord, I want to pray this morning that you would reveal yourself to them. May you fill their lives with love, joy and peace. The love that comes from you, the joy that comes from you and the peace that comes from you. I pray you would do that during this time now for your glory in Jesus' name. Secondly, I want to pray for you if you would say I am part of Christ Church Fairham. Christ Church Fairham is my church and of course I love my brothers and sisters in Christ who I worship with every week who I'll see on Zoom in our prayer meeting at 11.15 and whom I long to gather in person again with um, which we, we hope will happen very soon but I want to pray for you if you're part of our church and have been regularly attending these online services at, and meeting with us in person when we were able to do that. Let me let me pray for you. Lord God, I thank you for the church. I, th I thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, may this church service bless them. Would it strengthen them in their faith? Would, would you reveal the glory and the beauty and the compassion and the power of Jesus Christ to them during this time, that their faith may grow and our love as a church would abound. Our love towards you, Lord, would abound and grow, and our love for one another would also grow during this Sunday service. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thirdly and finally, I know that there have been Christians um, from lots of different churches all over the United Kingdom who have been tuning in and watching our online services. You're very, very welcome as well, and I'd like to pray for you as well. Lord, we thank you for the universal church, the church that is global across the entire world. And so, Lord, we thank you for Christians who are tuning in who are not um, regular members, regular parts of Christ Church Fairham. Lord, we just we pray again. May this service bless them. And Lord, in particular, I want to pray for anyone who um, is tuning in who's a Christian, who's not part of a local church. Lord, would you guide them? Would you guide their footsteps so that they not only watch services online, but would find a place in a local church? And, and Lord, if there are people watching who are in the Fairham area who are not part of a local church, Lord, I pray they would find us. May they reach out to us uh, that we might welcome them into a local family of God where they will, will not only hear great and preaching and great teaching, but they'd also experience the love of a community who love the Lord Jesus Christ and love one another. Lord, I just pray that this service will be a blessing to, to those who aren't Christians, to those who are members of Christ Church Fairham, and for Christians all over the country, maybe even all over the world. Lord, thank you for your love for us. I pray you would use this service for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We've got a great service planned. Rob Hanny from Christ Central Portsmouth is going to lead us in sung worship. And so we're very grateful to Rob for serving us in that way. I'm going to lead us in prayer. And then Jeff's going to preach from Psalm 23 and encourage us as we focus on Jesus, our Lord and our shepherd. It's going to be a great service and we're going to kick it off by singing together. All the words will appear on the screen. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for his dream. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. The faded one to find me sends by my front wheels. The faded one to find me sends by my front
Stay in that place of worshipping God together. I want to lead us in prayer and in particular I want us to focus our prayers on the magnificence of Jesus. And so I'm going to read to us um, from Colossians chapter 1 and I'm reading from verse 16 which speaks about the glory of Jesus Christ. By Jesus All things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Let's pray together and worship God the Son, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, as we come to you in prayer and we come to you in worship, we want to just proclaim the excellencies 
of your Son, Jesus Christ, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. Lord, we thank you that Jesus is the creator God. By him, through him, all things were created. We thank you that Jesus not only created the world, created the universe, he also upholds the universe by the word of his power. He is the sustainer, he is the creator and the sustainer. Lord, we cannot comprehend such power, such creativity. All we can do is marvel and worship you, Lord Jesus. We praise you and worship you for the for creation and for sustaining all of creation. We thank you that creation it was not only created by you and through you, but also for you. All of creation, Lord Jesus, is for you, for your glory and for your praise. And so we join with creation in bringing you praise. May we live for you with everything that we are, we pray. May we be part of creation that brings you great, great glory. And I thank you that the church does bring you great glory, Jesus, for you are the head of the church, the leader of the church, the shepherd of the church. And so we praise you for that. We thank you that you were the first to be resurrected. You defeated death. You rose from the grave. And we Christians, all who have faith in you, Jesus, follow in the way and the road that you have created. Just as you were resurrected from the dead, so all who have faith in you will also be resurrected into eternal life. You are preeminent. You are first and glorious in the resurrection. And we look to that day where we will follow in your footsteps and enter into eternal glory. Thank you for the salvation you have won in your resurrection. And we thank you also for your death upon the cross. Thank you, Jesus, that you were born in human flesh. God became a man, fully God and fully human, born with a mission to die on the cross and by dying to reconcile us to God the Father. We were once enemies of God, hostile to God, rebelling against him, ignoring him, alienated and distant from God. But all who have faith in Christ have been reconciled to God through your death, Lord Jesus. And so we thank you for your love and your humility that took you to the cross, that you would die to save us. You would die to reconcile us to your Father. We are so grateful for that great love shown on the cross. And once again, we're filled with worship because the creator God also was was the God who died on the cross. Jesus, in humility, you came to die for us, to rescue us. And we're so, so grateful. Lord, I pray for every Christian watching, fill our hearts with thanksgiving once more at who you are and what you have done. And Lord, I pray for anyone who does not know you. And I pray that they would be filled with wonder at who Jesus is and what he has done. May they be reconciled to God the Father through faith, through the death of Jesus upon the cross. I pray, Holy Spirit, move in power now to change the lives of all the people watching. Lord, as we pray, I also want to pray for those who are suffering those who are struggling with with ill health, those who are mourning things that they have lost, things and people that they have lost, those who are just struggling because of the circumstances we find ourselves in. And Lord, we thank you for the hope of the gospel described in Colossians 1, the hope of the good news of Jesus. And I pray for all who are suffering. Lord, would you bring healing? Would you bring physical healing to those who are feeling ill? But more than that, would you flood lives with hope now, Lord God? Fill our hearts with hope that we might be filled with joy because of Jesus Christ, because of his death on the cross, because of his resurrection to new life, because of the hope of eternal glory in resurrection for all who have faith in Jesus. Lord, again, I ask that this hope, the hope of you, Lord God, would transform lives today. Lord, we worship you. We thank you. We bring you praise and glory. In fact, Lord God, we say you fill us with such joy. You are our song. And we want to sing you songs of praise, 
giving you glory, bringing you a worship for who you are and all you have done. Lord, you are our song. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. We're going to look at Psalm 23. I'm reading from the NIV. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, we just ask that you would bless us as we look at your word, strengthen, encourage, and motivate us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Psalm 23 was written by the uh, King David, probably the greatest king Israel ever had. But before he was a king, he was also a shepherd boy. 
And so he draws on his experience during that time to describe who the Lord is. Of course, we appreciate and understand he's speaking of Jesus. But it's fair to say that his experience as a shepherd is very different to what our shepherds perhaps would experience today. So, for example, David would have led his sheep from the front. So shepherds would recognise the, sh- the uh, uh, sorry, the sheep would recognise the shepherd's voice. And so in the evenings, what would happen on the plains and on the hills is that different shepherds would gather together for protection and bring their flocks together with them. It was safer in numbers, obviously. Uh, And in the morning, when one shepherd wanted to leave and go off and find his pasture, it would be his voice that the sheep would recognise. And that's how they'd come out from the multitude of other sheep, because of his voice. It was a distinctive call to them. And that's how he was able to lead from the front. Now, his, his journey to find the pasture in these fields could take many days. It wasn't like in England where we've got green fields all over. Uh, Over in Israel, it was a little bit different. And so the journey would sometimes take a while. Shepherds were warriors, not like our shepherds. Uh, David spoke himself of how whilst he was a shepherd, there was a time he had to kill a lion and another time a bear. I don't think you're going to get that on the hills around Hampshire. The shepherd would carry a rod, and a rod was like a metre-long weapon. It had an iron, piece of iron or metal at the end that would, in order, would enable him to attack any predators that came. And he had a staff. A staff would be a long piece of wood with a hook on the end, and the hook served two purposes. One was to pull the sheep if they wandered or they fell down a, a little crack, He could lift them out, but secondly, it enabled him to rest on it during his long journeys. Shepherds in David's day were very different to the shepherds of today. They had no dogs, they had no drones overhead, and they had no GPS tracking. It was just the shepherd, his voice, his rod, and his staff amidst many dangers. David's psalm was picked up in later years by some of the Old Testament prophets to describe uh, God's relationship with his people and also how God would describe uh, what was going on in Israel at the time. Two classic passages are Jeremiah 23 and Ezekiel 34. If you have a moment to read them, you'll see that some of the comments that God makes are not encouraging because the shepherds, the leaders of the uh, people of Israel at that time were abusing them. They weren't protecting them. They were being selfish in their attitudes. It wasn't good. Other parts are encouraging. But Ezekiel speaks of how God is so disheartened and cross with the shepherds, the leaders of the people at that time, that God is going to send a new shepherd, a good shepherd, and that he himself would shepherd his people. Can you imagine, therefore, many years later, if you were stood in Israel at a time when Jesus was around the area, walking and speaking and teaching, and Jesus arrives and he says these words. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus was declaring, I am the fulfilment of the prophecy, of the promise from God that there would be a shepherd who would come one day and be willing to love God's people, and lay down his life for them. So as we look at this psalm, as we, in a sense, race through it, we've got to realise that this is Jesus we're looking at. This is who he is. He is that good shepherd, 
the one who is prepared and indeed, as we know, looking back, did so lay down his life for you and for I. So let's look at the first verse. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Now, this is a declaration of trust. It's a personal statement from David. The Lord, Jesus, is my shepherd. Therefore, I lack nothing. We know that sheep are defenceless. They have no real weapons to fight with themselves. They have very little skills and they're very easily frightened. And yet David is saying that the Lord, his shepherd, provides all safety and in even provision. Now, if you want to read a book on Psalm 23 uh, that will bless you and amaze you, and I've picked out some points from it, I'm just going to read a, a paragraph from a book entitled The Good Shepherd by Kenneth Bailey. I hope you can see that. Well worth a read. Uh, this is what he says of this opening verse. The Lord is my shepherd, among other things, means I have no police protection. In, the, in those open, trackless spaces, the traveller and his companions are alone. Thieves, wild animals, snakes, sudden blinding dust storms, water shortages, loose rocks and furnace-like heat are all potential threats to any traveller. All of this was affirmed in the 12th century by the Armenian Orthodox tradition through the extensive commentary on the Psalms composed by one of the bishops. He wrote, the Lord is my shepherd. In other words, I wandered in the midst of beasts, dogs and bulls that surround me. Lions opened their mouths and wished to ravish me. I was terrified. And because of fear, I made a treaty with the Saviour. Therefore, do not be afraid, O my soul, for he is my shepherd and I shall not want. The good Archbishop knew full well that the opening verse of this psalm is a profound commitment to the Lord as the source of security in the midst of many dangers where no other help is available. Without hesitation, the sheep confidently follow the shepherd, knowing that with him in the lead, all will be well. The rest of the psalm expounds the meaning of this first line. Kenneth Bailey, the Good Shepherd. The point is, it's a personal statement of trust. He is all I need because I trust him. He is my shepherd. But it's not until we choose to put our trust in him, Jesus, as our Lord and Saviour, that he becomes our personal shepherd. You can be in church all your life. You can go through all kinds of religious ceremonies. You can live as good a life as possible. Yet, the Christian life will only begin when we personally recognise the need for a saviour to save us and forgive us of our sin. And we respond to that revelation of Jesus by choosing to follow him in making him our Lord and our shepherd. So before we go on, let me ask you, have you made that decision? Is he your shepherd? Do you trust him? For when we do, he will protect, he will guide, he will provide. He is my shepherd. And because of that personal trust in him, I lack nothing. Verse 2, David goes on to say, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Now, as I've said, we know that the sheep are easily frightened. And they only lie down having eaten and feeling safe. And so David is saying, the Lord provides and protects. Jesus does not lead us into any old provision. Green pastures were the very best. And they were in short supply. 
and the journey to them may have taken the sheep and the shepherd a few days. Isaiah said in chapter 26, he said, you will keep, speaking of God, you will keep in perfect peace those who mind, whose minds are steadfast because they trust you. You see, it's because we trust him that we can lie down beside quiet waters. We can go to the green pastures and feed well and know peace. Dear friends, don't ever believe that somehow God has got for you a lesser option. That somehow, you know, it's okay for everyone else, but green pasture for me? No, no, mine will just be a little brown or a few, a weed patch. No, that's not your God. He will only ever take us to the best, to the green pastures. I often meet Christians who have this kind of approach as though, oh, I'm not worthy of the best. You know, well, green pastures is fine for others. I'll just make do with the scraps. Look, friends, that's outrageous. That's not what God promises. That's what you've decided to believe. It's not what Jesus promises to do when we trust him and follow him. He makes us lie down by green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters so I know peace and I know provision. The danger is if we've settled for a dull, a boring, an unadventurous Christian life, then the truth is we've wandered from the path that the shepherd had for us and we've settled for a lot less. As I say, sheep only lie down when they feel safe, when they've been well fed and it's because of the Lord's guidance and his presence that we can do that. His provision and our trust in him is what finds us true peace and contentment. David goes on. In verse 3 he says, He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Now, what he's speaking of here, he refreshes my soul is describing when the shepherd rescues the sheep. The sheep's wandered, it's got into trouble, it's gone down the wrong path, and the shepherd goes after it and finds it and brings it back. That's what his staff was used for. Often people think this means somehow, oh, he cheers me up when I'm feeling a little glum. That's not the case at all. Sheep wander. You and I go astray from God's best plan for us. Isaiah said, we all like sheep have gone astray. Perhaps if I read you a couple of verses from some old hymns some 200 years ago, which actually would be great to sing them again some days. One of them is the king of love my shepherd is. This will describe it how uh, they understood all those years ago. One verse says, I'm not going to sing it. Perverse and foolish oft I strayed, but yet in love he sought me, and on his shoulder gently laid, and home rejoicing brought me. And then Isaac Watts set this psalm also to verse in the 18th century. He wrote, he brings my wandering spirit back when I forsake his ways, and leads me for his mercy's sake in paths of truth and grace. What David's saying is when we wander, when we fall, when we get distracted by what sparkles, when our life's priorities get wrong, when our circumstances overwhelm us and we divert our gaze from Jesus to our problems, that's when he comes. That's when he comes and draws us back. And David himself knew some classic cases of this happening. King David, in, in the Old Testament, we read of his uh, adulterous affair with a lady called Bathsheba. She was married to another guy. And David had 
this her husband killed during a battle to make sure he was at the front of the fight uh, in order that he could then marry Bathsheba. It was outrageous. He overlooked his son's disobedience because of his favouritism to him. These are just a few, and David made many, many mistakes. But he understood that when he wandered, when he went off the right path that God would have him go, as soon as he repented, as soon as he recognised it and turned and asked for his forgiveness, the shepherd's hook would come and gently bring him back onto the right path. Many years ago, I was on a, when I was working for B&Q, I used to travel a lot and I was just coming back from a conference in Vienna. And I knew my life, I was a Christian, I'd been baptised, I knew God, I knew Jesus, uh, but I'd wandered, I'd gotten into a way of life that wasn't honouring of him. I was, had a, lived with a lady and then had a relationship with somebody else, it wasn't good, nothing I'm proud of. But as I sat on this plane, <coughs> reflecting on my life, I just made a cry from the heart. I just said, God, please get me out of this. Or perhaps what I was saying was, God, get me off this path. Guide me to the right path. I, I landed, got home. The lady I was living with said, thanks, but let's call it a day. <coughs> I suddenly had the opportunity in the space to get down. I spent hours just talking to Jesus, repenting, and had some amazing times knowing his presence. It was a beautiful experience and soon after that I met Laurie my wife and actually we got married 13 weeks from the day we first kissed but that's another story the thing is the shepherd is just looking for the sheep to bleat for the sheep to cry out Lord I'm on the wrong path help me and before you know it you will feel that gentle hook drawing you back to himself. Now this verse gives me great hope, not just from my own experience and reading it in, uh, in God's word, but actually many of us know friends and family who did once walk well with Jesus. But now, to be honest, we'd probably say there's little evidence of a daily faith going on. But this verse tells me that if they were genuinely saved, and ultimately only God knows that, Jesus will draw them back to himself. He will bring them back. He will not lose any. Why? Because this verse tells me, but also this verse bases my confidence on the statement that it's for his namesake. In other words, it's his reputation that's at stake. And he promises he will lose none. If you read in Luke 15, the wonderful story about how the good shepherd goes to hunt and search and find the one sheep that's wandered. I can be confident because Jesus' reputation is at stake. It's not about me or my worth or what I've done or I haven't done. It's because he's promised and he cannot deny who he is and what he's promised to do. Dear friends, no one is too lost. No one is too far away to feel the shepherd's rod reaching out to them to draw them back when they repent. He rescues and he restores. David goes on to say, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Guys, following Jesus will take us through tough times. We're actually promised to experience suffering, trials and conflicts. These are unavoidable. And personally, looking back in my life, I'd say they are essential and necessary. It's in these valleys when you discover more about yourself that needs to be changed, but also you discover more about Jesus and how faithful and true to his word he is. But what an assurance we have that in those times 
He is with us. Let's prepare ourselves for those dark valleys that maybe are coming or indeed you may presently feel you're in in this difficult time. Let's remind ourselves that we walk through the valleys. There are no seats for us to stop. We're going through. That means also there's an exit. Even though you may not see it now, there's an exit to your valley. But most wonderfully is that it's Jesus that we walk with. And that the shepherd was a guy in David's day, certainly not in our day, where nowadays you see pictures of shepherds with a sheep on their arm, somehow like a cute little lamb. No, no. The shepherd of David's day would lift the sheep up and put him on their shoulders and it would be heavy and a burden, but he would carry them. This is what Jesus is saying. In your darkest valley, he's with you with his rod and his staff. Now his rod, as I've said, is a weapon to fight off predators and his staff is the hook to pull us when we stumble or wander and we feel his gentle nudge on us through the dark valley. Dark valleys will come. And as I say, some of you may feel you're in them at present. But let me ask you, who would you choose to have with you in the midst of these times? Who would you take into the valley with you? Friends and family? Your, your wealth? Your health? Well, maybe they can help in some small degree. But guys, what's important is the incomparable might and majesty and glory of Jesus Christ walks with you through every step of your valley. And he holds his rod, his rod of authority, the rod, his voice that cast the stars into, into the sky, that sustains the earth, that created everything you see as around us. He is the very one who walks through this valley with you. I tell you, nobody will mess with you when they see who's beside you and, who's, and, and in whom you've placed your trust. Maybe sometimes when we're in our valleys, we need to just stop and remind ourselves who it is beside us. Then David goes on in verse 5, he says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Tell me, have you ever felt downtrodden, discouraged by the criticism or cruel comments from others because of your love for Jesus? Or have you ever experienced surprise from others that they think, what, well, God would bless you? Who, you? Do you feel kind of worthless? Or as though everybody else is so much better than you, you don't really fit in, wherever you may be. This is what David's referring to. And to emphasise the point, what he's doing is he changes the picture, the analogy from shepherd and sheep, to a host and their guest. Now in a culture where your hospitality was the measure of who you are, so in other words, who you are is defined by how generous you are, we see that Jesus goes beyond all norm, goes to outrageous expressions of his affection for his guests through his generous hospitality. He provides a table that is so lavish, it overflows before our enemies. And it's Jesus' way of saying, I don't care what other people think of you. I don't even care of what you think of yourself. What matters is what I, Jesus, think of you. And I'm going to demonstrate to you before everybody how much I love you and care for you. Perhaps the best way to illustrate this is to tell you the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, uh, it's in the Gospels, is a Jewish tax collector. Now tax collectors 
in the day of Roman occupation of Israel, uh, they were hated because they were Jews, but they used to rob their own people. So the Romans expected a certain, certain amount that the collector would, would get, uh, but he had the freedom to double that if he wanted and keep the rest for himself. So Jesus is coming to this town and he's like a big celebrity. Lots of people have heard of him and they're gathering and lining the road in order to see him and shout and say hello and welcome him. He is the, the dignitary. And all the local village elders and town elders and celebrities are all there because it's important. They're seen to be with him. And the elders would have wanted to organise everything, uh, to tell him where he's going to eat and sleep, to tell him who he's going to mix with and do favours to the affluent people of the town and, you know, buy goodwill, etc. It was a great honour for the host to have him come to their place. But Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus, but he couldn't find a space. Everywhere he tried to push through, people would probably kick him, push him, and even just punch him because they hated him so. So eventually, <clears throat> he goes up a tree, he finds a sycamore tree, and he climbs this tree and he looks through the branches. It's the only safe place he can find to get a glimpse of Jesus. And as Jesus comes down through the town, he stops right in front of this tree. And he looks up and he says to Zacchaeus, I'm going to come and eat with you and stay with you. Which in this culture to eat with someone was an act of friendship, a statement of I want to be your friend, I want to get to know you, etc. Jesus cut through all the culture. The most hated person on that road was the person that Jesus stopped everything for and honoured by saying I'm going to eat with you. And the hatred, if you read the passages, the hatred that was aimed towards Zacchaeus was instantly diverted to Jesus. Now they were offended because of Jesus' decision. For Jesus to honour Zacchaeus in front of all those who hated him and take the hatred upon himself is what David's describing. In the midst of my enemies, in the midst of those who don't like me, criticise me, in the midst of those who look down on me. Jesus brings you to a lavish table and prepares a feast for you, lavishes goodness and food and wine and oil upon you as a statement to your enemies, to those perhaps who look down on you and says, I don't care what you think. I love this person. Dear friends, if that's if Jesus is your saviour, that's what he does for you. It doesn't matter what other people think, because you know how he feels towards you. And we all have a seat as Christians in that great banquet at the end that the Bible describes. But until then, the Lord continues to demonstrate his favour and lavish his love upon you in the face of critics in the face of your enemies, and he is oblivious. He doesn't care what people think. Such is his love for you. David finishes by saying, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When the sheep set out, the shepherd leads from the front, because the sheep don't know the way to the pasture. But as they make the journey and turn around at the end to come back home to their home farm or home base, they know the way back. So the shepherd now, now uh, positions himself at the back in order to protect and make sure all get home. So we can see any wandering wanderers. What an assurance we have. An assurance that there is a home. An assurance that the eternity that the Bible talks to us about and promises us is guaranteed not only just because of what we read but actually because Jesus himself is following us to make sure we get home to dwell in the house of the Lord forever to be with him throughout all eternity and it's his goodness that keeps us on the right path to get us there it's his goodness that helps us resist temptations and order our priorities well 
You see, his goodness is the Holy Spirit, who when we become Christians comes into our heart and transforms us bit by bit. It's why we call ourselves born again. It's that experience of the Holy Spirit coming into our heart and changing us and beginning this process we call sanctification of maturing and changing to be more like Jesus. And Jesus comes and it's his goodness, it's the Holy Spirit's work in us that keeps us on the right path, directs and guides us, nudging us every now and then when we do things or say things that are stupid and wrong, helping us with issues like unforgiveness, unrepented sin, greed and bitterness and similar. And it's his very nature of kindness and gentleness and holiness that surrounds us. And his love follows us home. It's never absent. This isn't a love that is deserved, a love that isn't earned, and a love that is never given in small measure. This love is always given in its fullness. The Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians 1, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day <coughs> of Jesus Christ. God's promise to you is if you've received the Holy Spirit, if you've become a Christian, he will get you home. His goodness and love will follow you all the days of your life so that you can dwell in the house of the Lord. And remember, it's for his namesake. It's his reputation. He can do no different. He can do nothing else. He is committed to you to guide you in the right ways and follow you with his love and his goodness every step of your life. Friends, becoming a Christian begins a journey. We travel to good pasture and we travel through dark valleys. There are predators looking to pounce. Sin tries to entice us away. We fall and we stumble at times. We get lost and we drift from his narrow path. And if that wasn't enough, there are people in the world who just don't like us because we're Christians and look down on us. But praise God, we have a shepherd, a shepherd who will lead us, a shepherd who will guide us, a shepherd who provides for us, a shepherd who protects us, a shepherd who brings us true peace. He rescues and restores us. He walks through our dark days with us. Never will his love be missing in our lives. Never is his love given in short measure. His presence helps us stay on the right path in the right way. His voice, a reassuring comfort. He has a rod so powerful that no one and nothing can stand in his way. And the staff so gentle None of us can doubt his love for us. What he brings to us along this journey is beyond measure. What others think of us in deserving such, he cares not. It's an amazing journey, an exciting adventure. Following Jesus as our shepherd is a joy and a privilege. And for some, that can be years and God bless you if you've been a Christian for all those years. But actually, it's not about the length of time. For others, it can be just a matter of months or a brief moment. But the truth is, however long we followed the shepherd, shepherd for, we will all get to the same destination. We will all get to that great banquet. We will all get to live through eternity in the presence of God. And where he's leading us to our true home, it's where pain has no place. Suffering has been silenced and temptation terminated. Whatever you face today, if Jesus Christ is your personal Lord, 
your personal shepherd, if you've said the Lord is my shepherd, lift your eyes to see your true home to where he's leading you to and look around and see him beside you in all circumstances. But dear friends, if he's not your Lord, if you can't say the Lord is my shepherd, he wants to be so. And he invites you today to make that decision, to follow him and trust him all the days of your life. The Lord is my shepherd, but is he yours? God bless you. Thank you to Jeff for that wonderful and encouraging message from Psalm 23. Let's respond together by praying together. If you're not a Christian, if you um, do not know Jesus as Lord and as your shepherd, can I just encourage you to, to join with this prayer, to listen to the words, and at the end of the prayer, say Amen, which means I agree. And by doing that, you'd be making the prayer your own. And so this prayer is, is going to be about um, following Jesus as Lord and Shepherd. And so I would love you to join in with this prayer, to, to, to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and personal Shepherd. I promise if you make that decision today, you will not regret it. Following Jesus is the very best thing in my life. That's why I, I, we do these services. It's why I'm part of this church. I, it's why I've gone into Christian ministry in order to, to declare as many people as possible this glorious reality that Jesus is the Lord and the shepherd and you can follow him and know his love and his care and his guidance. So, so if you're not a Christian, why not join in this prayer with us together? Heavenly Father, with David, we say the Lord is our shepherd. Jesus is our shepherd. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your care, your guidance, your love and your leadership. We thank you for your voice, Lord. That we, your sheep, hear and know your voice. And so we follow you. And I pray you would speak. I thank you that you have spoken to us during this service. I pray you would continue to speak to us during the prayer meeting head and throughout today that we might follow you more closely, follow in your footsteps. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the warrior shepherd. You protect us and defend us from the things we need protecting from. Lord, we, we need your defence. We need your protection. And so we thank you that you are the warrior shepherd. We thank you that you are the caring shepherd. And I pray now that each and every person would know your care, know your love, know your ample provision for us as your sheep. Lord Jesus, we love you. We say you are our Lord. We want to follow you. We want to obey your commands. And we say you are our shepherd. Where you go, we will follow. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. And we thank you for all you have spoken and all you have done in our midst today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching this video, our online Sunday service. As I've mentioned a couple of times, we have a prayer meeting on Zoom at 11.15. We would love to see you there where we pray for one another, we encourage one another, and we, we share a bit of time of chat and conversation about the day and the week ahead, catching up with one another as well. You would be most welcome and it's always a great time. God bless you and see you very soon. Bye-bye.